Hi, Faithful Politics listeners and viewers, of course. Welcome uh, to a new season. Is this our first of the new season? Yeah, well, it sure is. Oh my gosh, I didn't realize that. This is uh, your faithful host, Josh, and then we have uh, Will Wright in his COVID command center <laughs> that he's n newly named it, the political host. Um, and uh, we have on the show with us today, uh, Brian Kaler, and uh, we're excited to talk about that. So thanks for joining us, Brian. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Before we get into your bio, which um, which makes me feel like I should be bowing down to you and and I don't know, like paying homage or something or pinching a little salt on the uh, a little incense on the altar, you know. Um, but, uh, Will, how, how are you feeling? I know you had posted it and everything that you got the Rona, man. Yeah, I sure do. You know, and, and you know, I got the uh, I got the double Fauci ouchie. I got the the Wi-Fi booster. Um, still got it. But my kids got it. My wife, however, is COVID free. So, I mean, you know, amen to that. Um, but I, my, that. my, my guess is COVID wants nothing to do with a lady who gave birth to both of our children naturally, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so. <laughs> That's awesome, dude. So have you tried the horse tranquilizer yet? Um, I was going to do it once we're done recording. I didn't want to do it before oh, just gotcha. in case there's any like, you know, side effects or something. Issues, yeah. side effects, gotcha. I'm responsible. All right. Very good. Well, thanks guys. We're going to, we're going to get started here. Brian, thanks so much again. So Brian is an award-winning author and journalist. He serves as the editor and president of Word and Way. It's a Baptist magazine in the Midwest. And he's associate director of ChurchNet, which is a Baptist network in Missouri. Brian has authored uh, four books on religion and politics, uh, Vote Your Principles, uh, Sacramental Politics, um, Presidential Campaign Rhetoric in an Age of Confessional Politics, and For God's Sake, Shut Up. That's my favorite title. By the way. I, I Everyone that. always prefers that title. <laughs> he is a PhD and MA in communication from the University of Missouri and a BA in communication and Christian ministry from Southwest Baptist University. And his writings have appeared in numerous publications, including the Birmingham News, CNN.com, Columbia Tribune, Houston Chronicle, Kansas City Star, Roanoke Times, St. Louis Post Dispatch, Virginia Pilot, and Washington Post. So, Brian, thanks so much for being on. Is there anything I missed? Is there any Ooh. any other self self aggrandizement <laughs> that you want to bring out to us in our audience? Yeah, I mean, I'm married and have a kid, so that's also a pretty good accomplishment too. So, that's you know, a great throw that out there. That's awesome. Well, thanks so much for being on the. Uh, um, on with us today, you know, I, I started reading some of your articles and I just, uh, thought it was so fascinating. Um, the talks that you had, especially when, when I was just looking through the work you've done on Christian nationalism, how, um, how anti-Trump, I guess, is that okay? Can I say that? Are you okay? Yeah, with yeah. It? I, I think you, you don't have to read long to realize I'm not saying <laughs> that. You also used Trump a lot like this Trump's that was that intentional? I guess that's my first real question. Was that intentional? Like, I saw that during, it, it seemed to be like a pattern. Like, this trumps that. Yeah, I like puns. And so, you know, uh, you know, Biden I've used actually a couple of times, you know, like a Biden time or something, but it's, just, it's not as good. <laughs> it is uh, not as And, you know, Clintons just don't work. So, you know, no, Trump, yeah. Trump's been at least a gift in that regard. Dude, that is a great gift. You're right in terms of <laughs> So uh, let's, I'll just start with the first kind of more serious question. Um, so you've done a lot of work, of course, in, 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 on politics and religion, and we're glad to really glad to have you here. My first question is, um, you've done a lot of work on Christian nationalism. And, uh, and even I've seen um, several times where you've gone and, uh, and, and testified to uh, various legislative bodies um, concerning um, legislation that was coming out that you felt like maybe crossed that line um, between uh, separation of church and state. And, uh, and you refer to it as Christian nationalism. So I guess that here, again, all of us have a lot of different maybe uh, definitions of what we say for that. Define Christian nationalism for us um, and your understanding and, and tell us why it's a problem. 
Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, it's good to start with definitions. I think the easiest way to think about Christian nationalism is this is an ideology that confuses and conflates our Christian faith and our national identity. And that would be it be a possible in any country, but we'll stay focused on the context of the United States. Uh, one, because that's obviously where we are. And two, I think it's more significant to have more significant of a problem when you're dealing with a large empire type power. Right. I mean, you know, so like if you're a Christian in Moldova or something, it's, you know, Christian nationalism isn't as dangerous, I think, because there's not as much of a geopolitical threat then that can infect the faith. And so it's this idea that to be a a real American, you must be a Christian. And the, the flip of that, to, to be a, a good Christian, you also have to be a good American. And mm. I think that that is a very dangerous ideology, both for our democracy but it's also, and I'm more concerned even on this side, for our faith. And, you know, it is something that I have written about for years. I mean, I know a lot of people have talked about Christian nationalism since January 6th, but it's it's a real thing that has existed before that. And I and many others were naming it as Christian nationalism before January 6th. And I think that's important because some people will say, oh, y'all are just making this up. This is just a way to, you know, to, to attack Trump in January 6th and all that kind of stuff. But Christian nationalism was a real thing that we were talking about before that. Is is Christian nationalism? You you think more like is it a is it more of a just a Christian problem? You know, believer problem, or is it or is it a problem that transcends believers and non-believers? So I mean, I think that's a, that's an interesting question. So you know, for the United States context, Christian nationalism is the nationalism problem. So like in, in India, they're, they're having the problem of Hindu nationalism. So nationalism can become a problem in other places. It's generally going to be the problem with the dominant tradition. Whoever is the largest group is the group that's going to try to, to conflate their national identity with, with their religion. That being said, I would also note that I think a lot of people who fall into some of the Christian nationalist ideologies, you know, don't necessarily check a lot of the good boxes when it comes to like church faithfulness. And so they they would they would claim to be Christian, uh, but it is I mean Christian nationalism just put it right out there it's a heresy, uh, it, it's not just an ideology it's a heresy it's the distortion of the Christian faith, uh, to the point that many people who have who have adopted Christian nationalism I think probably aren't actually even truly Christian but they've been misled uh, in that in, on that road and so yeah I, I don't think it's just a problem for Christians but in the United States it's a problem for people who claim to be Christians. Mm, inter interesting and now. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, it, it seems like Christian nationalism takes root kind of in this concept that, you know, America was founded on a, on a, on Christian principles. And it's something that I, I keep hearing a lot from, um, certain factions of the American public. And, you know, it's, it's interesting whenever I hear that, because I think, well, okay, well, let, let's say that's true. Um, it was, the country was also founded by a bunch of men. And it was also founded by a bunch of white men. Um, so does that mean that, you know, America was founded on Christian white male principles <laughs> and thus like we should all, you know, bow to the king? <laughs> like if they if they check all those boxes, like like I, 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 I'm curious to kind of get, get your take on sort of the origin story of of, you know, the birth of a Christian nation. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, because, you know, the. The issue is if this is, is a Christian nation and the argument is that it's, that's by design, then, you know, the part of the argument has to be that we were founded as a Christian nation. I mean, that's that I, I really think that that is it's absolute for Christian nationalism. That that's the intention of this. And so they have to go back to the founding of the country to, to put forth this myth of a Christian nation. Uh, it's it's absolutely critical. But, you know, you raise a question that I think is really important. I mean, so we have two different ways we can look at this. We can look at the historical side. And I think it's really clear to say that we were not intended to be a Christian nation, that, that while some of the founders were Christian, uh, others were many of the prominent ones were deist. And by today's definition, I mean, Thomas Jefferson is literally like with his scissors, chopping up the New Testament, taking out all of the miracles. The guy is not a Christian by any classic evangelical definition of Christianity today. So, you know, it, it, to say that Thomas Jefferson wanted a Christian nation it's pretty crazy. Uh, he would be a, a heretic in most of our churches. But now some of the I mean, some of them are more faithful. So you have this you have this mix and combo. But if they if they wanted this to be a Christian nation, don't you think they would have said so? 
I mean, the only religious reference in the entire original Constitution, before you get to any of the, any of the amendments, is Article 6. No religious test for office. That's, there's no God. There's no, there's no other religious references in the Constitution, the foundational text for what they wanted this government to be, other than we're not going to have a religious test, which is actually kind of moving us away from being a Christian nation. Right? I mean, that's a pretty big deal. And so, first of all, there's the historical side. Now, that's, I think, to me, that's the easy debate, even though we keep having <laughs> this debate year after year, decade after decade for like 50 years. We've had the religious right claiming that we were founded as a Christian nation. But I think there's also another interesting question, and, and you, you alluded to this in, in, in your question, and that is, so let's just say, let's just say as a thought experiment, they really did mean for this to be a Christian nation. That's only true if we're talking about, about white male Christians. I mean, we're also talking about at the same time that they're founding this allegedly Christian nation, they're also enshrining slavery into the Constitution and into the lifeblood of this nation. I don't think that sounds very Christian. And, and that's why, I mean, it, it's important to think about Christian nationalism as white Christian nationalism. It is an ideology that is very much connected to white nationalism in general. And, and that's not to say that all who adopt Christian nationalism are white, but it is very much uh, dominated by, by whites. And it is an ideology that I think is, is very much has a racial component naturally embedded into it. And, and and so even if they intended to be this for a Christian nation, I think all of us today should be like, no, that ain't Christian. <laughs> so whatever it was that they were trying to found uh, with the slave state, we should say whatever that is, we 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 could move away from that. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I um, you know, the origin stories are always really fascinating to me because we we get so much uh, meaning out of uh, origin stories and. We get so much like they're so important for us, mm -hmm. you know, whether, whether they're true or not. <laughs> yeah, they're, so important. They're, they're just so important. Like we can't function without a sense almost of identity, which is so tied to um, our sense of origin, our sense of where we came from. And, you know, when I, one of the things that you talk about, which I thought was really interesting, and you've been a really big proponent of separation of church and state, thinking about the origin of those sep that separation of church and state in the Christian nation. So we have a constitution that from the very beginning um, made it clear in this first amendment that they made that there would be no uh, law establishing religion and that there would be no law preventing the free exercise thereof. And you've made a really big um, point of that, it seems like in your writing career and in your advocacy career, I even in one of the um, articles I read, it said that you, it was just you there defending against some a Missouri law. And I guess then you were with some a atheists and Satanists that were um, going against this law. And people were surprised, like people in the legislation were shocked that a pastor, especially a Baptist pastor, would be there um, a, a railing against this or advocating rather uh, is a better word against this legislation. So. Talk to us about this separation of church and state, where you see it. Obviously, it's a very complicated issue that's had a lot of history in the Supreme Court, both in the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. What, why is that so important for us? And um, yeah, and, and, and just talk to us about that in your mind. What, what's the core of what's going on there? Yeah, I appreciate that question because it is something that I'm passionate about, and it is something that also break some of our expectations today. To, I mean, when I, when I show up before a House or Senate committee you, you, here at the Missouri Capitol, and, and they're, you know, debating some bill about, you know, teaching the Bible in public schools or, you know, prayer in schools or, you know, putting in God we trust everywhere and, and often education, that's a key battle battlefield, but sometimes other topics as well. And, and you know, usually the testimony, the, 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 the four testimony for first, and it's, you know, it's a bunch of pastors and other Christian leaders. And then we get to the flip side and it's either usually just me by myself or I'm, you know, gathered with, you know, some atheists and Satanists and, and, and others. And I've gotten a few other pastors now to sometimes join me uh, there for the fun. But uh, yeah, the first, the first, so the first time I went by, it, it, I didn't realize the, the importance of speaking out as much. I just kind of went by, I said a few things. 
And but it was when I had introduced myself as a Baptist minister, and that's why I'm you know here opposing this bill to teach the Bible in public schools. And I saw the look of shock uh, on the faces of the lawmakers, and then the way that they treated me in questions differently compared to the only other person that day who was an atheist I've gotten to know uh, pretty well because we show up in a lot of these committees uh, together, uh, I realized there was the the importance of me showing up. So if, if as a member of the dominant tr faith tradition, and that's the faith tradition that people are trying to codify, that it's I have an extra responsibility to speak out. Because, you know, if if we establish a state church or some sort of official religion, I'm going to be okay. Right? Like I'm, I'm not, you know, all high on the persecution list. <laughs> I'm a Baptist. I mean, you know, I'm doing pretty good here in Missouri as well as you know, pretty much across the United States. Uh, and so, but I think then those of us that have that position of privilege in our society have an extra responsibility to speak out on behalf of others, those who would be targeted, those who would feel like they were being excluded from their own schools or their own country. And so I, I, but I come from this, though, as, as shocking it is to people, I, I come from this from a very historic position. I mean, Baptists started 400 years ago arguing for separation of church and state. The, the first book in English arguing for true religious liberty for all people was by one of the first two Baptist pastors. So because before that, people would say like, well, we don't think we should be persecuted. And so some of, some of the first people that came to the United States, what is now the United States, fled religious persecution started Massachusetts Bay Colony, and then immediately start persecuting other people, right? They, they weren't actually against religious persecution. They just didn't want to be persecuted. They, they were completely fine with taking the power of government and using it against others. What made Baptists unique at that time were they were the ones that were saying everybody, even the atheists and the Muslims, should have religious freedom to worship God as they please or don't at all. And that was really unique. And so, you know, you've got you've got Thomas Helways uh, back in Europe 400 years ago writing about this. Uh, and by the way, when he's writing this, so he writes this book, everyone should be free. There should be separation of church and state. And he sends it to the king of England, King James, right? uh, the, the King James who's on the Bible. <laughs> right. And so and these, these happen within a year of each other. He says, hey, we shouldn't establish religion. And King James puts out his authorized version and puts Thomas Helways in prison where he dies. So I'm just saying, like, I have a little bit of trouble with, you know, the King James version of the Bible in our Baptist churches because, you know, he killed our first pastor. And, and so, you know, and a little exorcism <laughs> there on, on, the, on the spine of our Bibles there. Uh, you know, maybe it's time to stop looking to the king to authorize our version. And, and, and separate things here a little bit, because, I mean, I do think it's bad for our country. I think it's bad when you have one faith tradition that is dominating. But I think it's worse for our faith. It never works well, right? It never works well when we unite church and state. Tony Campolo, Baptist author, speaker, I mean, he, he has put it the best. So I won't even try to top it. And when you mix church and state, it's like mixing ice cream and manure, <laughs> It doesn't hurt the manure, but it sure messes up the ice cream. <laughs> and that's what we got to keep it separate. It churches, separating church and state is good for both, but it's especially good for the church. That, I, I saw that quote in one of your articles. And I, it <laughs> I do love that quote. An amazing <laughs> quote. It's, very, it's, a, it's a profound quote. So I just have a follow-up um, to this. So you talked about how, you know, there's rel religious freedom, but they wanted it they wanted to escape persecution on themselves, but had no real intellectual issue with using the state to force people into some kind of religious um, mold. And of course, that was kind of, um, that's been kind of the norm in some sense. Mm -hmm. I mean, the separation of church and state was a modern idea, I would say, from what I understand. So here's my question. It's kind of an unanswerable question, but I love asking these because it makes us think, you know. Um, do you think there is something inherent about Christianity that laid the groundwork or the soil in which the, 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 the fruit of religious freedom could spring forth? Was there something in Christian liberty? And this is especially, I mean, Christi Christianity it's especially important. I think I just recently saw an article again. I haven't gone into depth, but John MacArthur saying 
in the Bible, religious freedom, you know, you've seen this is, 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 mm -hmm. is we don't believe in religious freedom biblically. It's, it's, uh, there is no religious freedom. Okay. So we have that. And then we have this nation that's dominated by Christianity in America, like as the, uh, as the, um, the ascendant view. So is there something inherent? And I guess, and, and I, I think you understand the question, but like, could, what could this have come out of a Hindu context, um, out of a Muslim context, out of an atheist context, um, out of something like that? Or is there something inherent in the groundwork just from what you understand of his, history? Yeah, that's a, I mean, that is a really good question. And I, I don't know if I can speak as much to some of the other religious traditions, but let me give you a theory uh, as to, to why I think it, it might have come out of, you know, certain segments of Christianity. And, and I think, I mean, you see it coming out of the wing of Christianity that particularly believes in, uh, so Baptists, though, Baptists are pretty much known for two things when they're start when they're starting right? the church state separation and believers baptism, uh, and we find the Anabaptists, you know, that are in, and they're, they're they're kind of they're connected and they're they're kind of interacting with each other. Uh, you know, that you know, bring into our, our Mennonites and, and that, those faith traditions today. All of them are kind of having these same conversations back at that same time. Also, very concerned about church state separation, uh, believers in believers baptism, right? And so there's there's this idea that that Entering the faith isn't by birth. It's a choice. It's a decision that you make at some point later. And I think that's the key. So I, so I don't think all, I don't think all branches of Christianity would naturally lead to this point. Some, some of our denominations have had a greater affinity for being the church state, uh, the state church. They, they have had, you know, they've had more connections with, with states and countries along their history. But I think the traditions that have emphasized evangelism and the, that, that moment of personal decision after you've reached some you know, age of being able to understand that, because if you don't have the option to say no, you don't really have the option to say yes. And so I think if we want there to be sincere conversions, if we want people to actually accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they must have that freedom. And so I do think there is something theologically grounded there that is that is leading to a natural understanding of uh, why we need to separate church and state. And I, what what concerns me is that a lot of Baptists, uh, a lot of evangelicals today that historically had theological reasons, they forgot why they were for this. And now that they're looking around and thinking, well, hey, Southern Baptists, we're the largest Protestant denomination. That means if someone's going to run this country, it could be us. So let's go for it. And so a lot have ditched the understanding of the separation of church and state. And I don't think it's going to be a helpful road down uh, as we continue down this model. I mean, I mean, look at it. it's happening with you know my generation. I'm a. I just had a birthday yesterday and I am one of the oldest millennials. <laughs> if you look at like all the designations, right? Like I'm, I'm one of the oldest millennials born in January of 81, right? So that's you, they start January 81. They're like, Hey, that's the millennial generation. So like, I, I'm an old millennial grandpa. Uh, yeah, I know. Right. I mean, millennials are in their forties now. So, I mean, you know, our, our media needs to quit talking about college students as millennials. Those aren't millennials anymore. So we millennials are getting old. And, uh, but, you know, if you look at my generation and later generations that are the rise of the nuns in N-O-N-E-S that, that are turning off from church, you know, one of the things, there's a lot of issues, but one of the things is, has been this, this connection between our churches, our faith and partisan politics that did not exist in future, ge future generations, in previous generations had not existed prior to 79, right before we come on the scene, we have this, this marriage of faith and politics in a way that had not happened before. And we've been turned off from it, right? right? I mean, we're walking away from the churches, literally. And so I don't think that this idea of trying to take over the state and codify our religion, religion, it hasn't been good. You know, that's, that's, that's so interesting. And, and I, and I'm curious on, you know, your, your, your take on the, the Christian witness in today's kind of day and 
day and age. Um, you know, if you're, if you're one that evangelizes, proselytizes, what have you, and, and really truly believe, you know, that Jesus is kind of like, he's the man, he's the way he he's changed you and you want other people to believe that. Um, but at the same time, you still believe that Trump is the president, you know? So like, like, how do you, how do you convince somebody that Jesus is real um, and Trump is still the president, you know, <laughs> like at, at the, at the same time, it seems like those ideas are sort of in conflict to one another. Right. Yeah. I mean, why would someone believe us if we're spouting a bunch of conspiracy theories? <laughs> I mean, you know, Trump's president, Santa Claus is real. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Wait, what? You know, w- spoiler alert to all the young <laughs> listeners. Uh, the, and, and, and yes, also, Jesus loves you and, and rose again and you can too, right? I mean, you know, if, when you start putting them all together, it's like, why would someone believe us on anything? And, and I do think that there's a credibility problem, a real credibility problem. And I mean, it, 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 it's going to take a generation to at least, I think, to, to cleanse ourselves from the last six years. I mean, that's how bad it's been. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I, um, you know... I got, I started following politics a little bit when I was first married, 2010. Um, Excuse me, I started following politics. And one of the things that I followed kind of closely, and I'll admit, I I was an Albert Moeller fanboy. All right, I listened to Albert Moeller. Um, I, I, I used to listen to him religiously, pun intended. Every single day. I, I don't any longer, although I do respect him. Um, but I, I, I really got, I, I would be at home. I worked from home in 2010, and I would just listen to podcasts. And, and they would be right conservative podcasts. And I, and I started, I got really concerned about same-sex marriage. And I started looking at reading books about like uh, Ryan Anderson who wrote the, uh, you know, co-author with, I think it was um, George something. I, I don't want to butcher the name or forget the name, but he wrote, what is marriage? It was a, it was a Harvard uh, law um, uh, publication. And then it became a book and he's written now several books on transgender. And there's been a lot of controversy and his books being banned on Amazon and things like that. And you see like Mark Walsh, uh, is it Mark Walsh, Matt Walsh, where his books are banned on. So, so you get this book banning and you get this, the liberal media is against us or studies about how some 95% of the media vote, voted for Hillary or something like that, or voted for Democratic or, or Obama. And you, and you get these studies that come out and, and there's so much, it feels like there's so much um, fuel for the fire, you know, and I've, I've, I've since then tempered my view. And honestly, a big part of it has been my relationship with Will. Um, the fact that my brother-in-law, uh, he came out to my wife and I as uh, that he was homosexual and he got married to his, um, uh, um, you know, his, his boyfriend and, and, uh, and, now, and now they're married and, and uh, we, we love them and, and a lot of, so I've been tempered, right, by this, but I still have core beliefs that are very much the same. And I think that my question here, I'm just giving some context there, because there's a lot of people, I think, like me, people like me are like me. So, I, you know, there, I think there's a significant amount. And I know because I've talked to a lot of people that feel, um, you know, very afraid of the religious liberty, um, religious liberty into the future in America, right? I'm very afraid. So the fear that people had when Trump got elected that I saw in some people that were close to me, fear. I saw that same fear in, in people in Ohio when I was there with them and they were talking about Obama got reelected. They were so afraid, in bed, like depressed. Okay, Then I saw the same thing with Trump. And I almost saw the same, like, almost the same stories being told our liberty is under attack our democracy is under attack on both sides my question for you is religious liberty what are your concerns about it currently should we be concerned 
as Christians. Take case, case example, you know, same sex marriage and all the litigation that's gone for that, like in surrounding that um, topic. Is there anything you're concerned about and what should Christians do in, in yeah. this political context? So I, I'm actually really concerned, but maybe not in the way you're asking. I am concerned that we're going to lose the concept completely because it has become so partisan. Right? And so uh, I feel like that it's, it's become – it's I mean, it's almost become redefined. right? And so both sides are giving up on what I would call religious liberty for all, which, which is the only true religious liberty. You know, if, you don't, if you don't believe in religious liberty – for all, then you don't believe in religious liberty at all. Right? So if it's just religious liberty for me and my folk, that's not religious liberty. Right? That's that's religious domination. And so on the right, I feel like that that's the version that has been very successfully pushed in recent years of we need to codify our religious beliefs, almost to the point that we take the two clauses in the First Amendment and, and they're pitted against each other. Uh, and so it's this idea that, well, if you don't let me exercise, if you don't let me, if you don't let me codify my religion, you're not letting me exercise my religion. Right. And so there's been this war against the establishment clause, the idea that there should be no establishment, that whatever I say I want to do to freely exercise my faith, you have to let me do it, including through the mechanisms of government. And we've got a couple of Supreme Court justices that are that are that are doing this as well, that are pushing this agenda. The Establishment Clause is on life support, uh, and if we lose the Establishment Clause, we lose truly religious liberty for all. On the flip side of that, then I feel like when I have conversations with my friends on the left, I have to explain to them why religious liberty is still an important value, right? that it's not just a, a sword against you know, gay people which is what a, a lot of the caricature on the left is, is that, well, religious liberty is just what people do because they want to they wanna hold, hold back the gates, right? I mean, that, that's the caricature that has happened. And so both sides, I think, have given up on true religious liberty. And that's really concerning uh, because it's, it's such a bedrock principle. And I think it was something that was a significant force for good in our nation. Uh, we haven't always had it. We had it aspirationally in the Bill of Rights. We had many periods where we didn't really have it, but for much of the 20th century, we had a really healthy understanding of both free exercise and no establishment, and we've lost that. And so I'm really concerned about you know, religious liberty moving forward. Hmm. Now, now on on January 6th, um, the, you know, an important date, American history, just recently celebrated the one year anniversary. Um, personally, kind of from an academic standpoint, I I, I'm glad that that date is memorialized in people's heads because like most people are sort of disconnected through our, our like electoral college system. So like most people don't know that there's like this thing that happens, you know, <laughs> like, so, so, you know, it's sad that it took a riot insurrection, whatever you want to call it like, to, to make that stand out in people's minds. But regardless on that date, you know, there was a scene that I saw in all the footage that was floating around, um, of these um, Christians, I'll, I'll put it in quotes, cr Christians um, that were on the floor of the Senate um, to include the the Q the QAnon shaman praying like on the floor chamber, you know, invoking the name of Jesus with like Trump flags, Christian flags, American flags, you know, and. And, uh, and it was just, it was just such a crazy, I mean, like as a believer myself, it was just a crazy image just to see. And I, and I'm curious on, on kind of like your, your, your thoughts of that, if you saw it and, you know, and maybe, maybe a little bit of, I don't know, like, maybe if you can answer, like, how did, how did we get here? You know, how do we get to that point? Yeah. So how did we get there? I, is maybe, I mean, I may have a different answer than, than you're expecting, uh, so when the when the the QAnon shaman right the guy with the furry hat and the horns like he's the one that led the prayer mm -hmm. and so yeah I mean, he you know he they, they he he starts to pray and everyone's like oh wait wait we need to take our hats off so they all take their maga hats <laughs> off and he takes off his you know furry hats and horns and then gives this prayer which I mean honestly is a you know it's a prayer not too much unlike what you might hear in a traditional evangelical <laughs> or maybe a little Pentecostal you know church 
uh, it's the context, of course, that makes it, you know, like God has baptized this, this insurrection moment that we broke into the Senate chamber. But, you know, at the same time, so how did we get here? I mean, that wasn't the first prayer from the Senate pulpit that day. Mm-hmm. The earlier one, though, was the Senate chaplain. So, I mean, Christian nationalism didn't break into the Capitol all that day. It had already been invited and paid to be there. <laughs> I mean, we literally, we have, we have a chaplain in the House and the Senate where we, we have our congressional leaders elect somebody to this government job. They're paid by the taxpayers, you know, us, to pray on behalf of the government. To pray on behalf of us, their prayers every day are recorded in the congressional record as the official government speech, and they pray on behalf of the members of the center of the house, which is pretty much chaplain there for, and on the behalf of the country, right? And they have always been Christians, of course, right? So, I mean, we have had this, like, soft, friendly version, <laughs> cuddly version of Christian nationalism for a long time, and some of my friends on the left don't like it when I do this because both the chaplains are, I mean, you know, the Senate chaplains uh, a uh, 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 what Black Seventh Day Adventist, uh, I think, um, and the the new House chaplain who started like three days before January sixth last year. I mean, <laughs> yeah. she had like a baptism by fire there, um, but she was the first female chaplain, uh, congressional chaplain. Um, I actually had a piece for a roll call that was published the day before the insurrection. We didn't know it was going to be, but it was about why we should get rid of the, the chaplains. Um, that was January 5th, 2021, because we had this new chaplain and I had a bunch of liberal friends that were really excited that, you know, we had a, a female Presbyterian and she was the first female chaplain, like, yay for you know gender equality. And I'm all for women as pastors. And I think there should be uh, equality in the pulpit. But I don't think there should be a chaplain at all. So for congressionally, like, I mean, why, why do we have government chaplains giving us government prayers? I mean, so we've been fooling ourselves, I think, for a long time in thinking that, you know, we had everything figured out. And I think January 6th was a wake up call on so many fronts. And it should be a greater wake, call, wake up call than it has been so far on Christian nationalism. We, 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 it's been embedded in our government and in our society. I mean, if you grow up in a white Christian church, like I did, it's in the air we breathe, right? It's, I mean, it's, it's literally in the hymnal. In the Baptist hymnal, there's a whole section of patriotic songs, and, and we would <laughs> sing them on July 4th, right? Uh, I mean, who are we worshiping? At some point, it gets a little confusing. I, 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 I skip church now, the Sunday closest to the 4th of July. I can't do it. I just, I can't. I, I spent six years in a Mennonite church where there's no flag in the sanctuary and we never sang patriotic hymns and I can't go back. And so, you know, even though I'm, I'm back in a Baptist church now, like I, I'm, I go camping that weekend of my family, <laughs> whatever it is to take to just not be in church. Cause I can't do it. We, we, I, I hope January 6 helps us realize not just the danger of Christian nationalism is violently storing the Capitol, but the danger of Christian nationalism embedded in every, nearly every single church across the country. Mm, wow. You know, uh, to, to that same end, you know, I, so I'm former military, you know, we, we do pay for, um, you know, like military chaplains as well. <laughs> like a lot of them actually. Um, and, and I, I spoke with, a, I spoke with somebody recently about this and, and they're saying it's like, it's like one of the best gigs for, uh, for a pastor, you know, is to get sort of like a, a DOD chaplain spot because, like you don't have to worry about tithing. You don't have to worry about like, <laughs> you know, like like upkeep of the building. You know, because it's all like subsidized. It's all appropriated. You know, and like the uh, NDAA. You know, so when they the government spends seven hundred billion dollars a year, you know, on on defense, like some of that money goes into like your infrastructure. <laughs> so, I feel like you're doing an infomercial now. I mean, we have people signing up. I mean, especially after two years of COVID pastoring, I mean, oh, I dude. feel for all the pastors out there. I mean, thank you. you know, I feel I for mean, myself. Seriously, I mean, seriously, Josh, I mean it. I mean, I, I've heard from so many pastors. It's been such a crazy couple of years. Oh yeah. Uh, I've been a pastor before, and I, I'm glad that I was not a pastor during COVID. That's, so, that's all. Just believe it. Yeah, I, you know, <laughs> we know God is faithful, though. You know, and and He has been. 
in in our eyes and for us, but I do appreciate the sympathy. Yeah. And, and but for all of you are pastors who are listening, like, I mean, I know like <laughs> October is like often like pastor appreciation month, but you just said I need to do 2022 needs to be pastor appreciation year. <laughs> you hear like, that well? Pastor hasn't, hasn't you hear quit. that well? Um, I mean, well, I haven't, I haven't charged <laughs> you for my friendship. So consider that, consider that my tithe. <laughs> if your pastor right. hasn't quit and a lot of them have, <laughs> like be extra nice to them this year. Just be nice. No emails. It's, yes. Um, so I want to shift the conversation just slightly, um, cause it's something that I thought was so fascinating. So you have been a proponent of reparations from what I've seen. Now you can correct me if I'm wrong or, or, or give the nuanced version of it. Um, I never, I'll be honest. I never even heard the word reparation until I met Will. No, it's and then it's just nonstop. It's like, <laughs> Will was my first African American friend that I ever had. I never, I, I, I didn't hear the word reparation until in the last few years. And I've heard the word, but I didn't even know it in the context. And you talk about the Southern Baptist being born out of, out of protecting slavery. You also talk about, and you, you made this claim in one of your articles, any church or organization, religious organization started before the Civil War, or I guess maybe you say organization, but you can correct that, whatever nuance, before the Civil War, or even 1900, up to 1900, should consider seriously uh, obeying the biblical mandate to make reparations. And one of the things you cited was Zacchaeus who paid four times what he had stolen. Uh, and he made a reckoning though and knew exactly what he had taken. Um, just expound on that. Reparations, like the history of the church. I know we have maybe just 10 or 15 minutes left, but the history of the church there um, and, and why make the case for reparations for us. Yeah, so I, I do. I do believe in reparations. I believe it's a biblical concept. And it's like in polling, it's literally one of the least popular political concepts today. So, you know, thanks for now, like shooting my popularity completely in this episode, because uh, feel free well, I, to plead I, the fifth. I, I, I've written about it. So, you know, I threw myself under the bus. So you no know, worries about it. So the yeah, I mean, so Let's take the Southern Baptist Convention, for instance, as an example. I grew up Southern Baptist. Uh, it was founded to support slavery, uh, which means that many of its churches, many of its institutions, we've mentioned uh, my good friend, Al Mohler, uh, Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, that was a little bit of a joke. Uh, Mohler and I have had some 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 fun online together. Uh, let's put it that way. In in, in debating topics like, like this, in fact, um, was founded then by people who gained their wealth that they gave to the seminary or to the churches that they stole off the backs, literally stole off the backs of the forced labor of African-Americans, right? That's a, a wealth then that has been inherited through generations upon generations. And then on the flip side, wasn't inherited. Like if you go and look at the black colleges and churches, you will find that most of them on average are much poorer than the white institutions. And why? Because the black community is much poor because it had nothing to inherit because it was stolen for for hundreds of years. And you you can't you can't pass on. I mean, if you have zero dollars, that's what you that's what you put in your will to your children. Zero dollars, right? And so this genera it's not just the wealth that was stolen then, it's the generational impacts of that wealth. And it's not good enough to now today have a, a rational awakening and say, we're sorry, which would actually would be still a good positive step in the right direction for some people. I know we have to first get the repentance level before we get the reparations. We're still working on the repentance for some people. But you asked about reparations. I mean, so Kevin Cosby, uh, he's the president of Simmons College of Kentucky uh, there in Louisville. Uh, it was founded because blacks weren't allowed to attend Southern Seminary. And so they they founded their own school. It's named instead of being instead of having buildings on campus named for enslavers, which is what Southern Seminary has in their undergraduate college. Boyce is named for uh, an enslaver. 
Uh, Simmons is named for someone who was born in slavery and then later became president of the school and transformed it. And, and, and Kevin Cosby has talked a lot about this issue of reparations and has helped me understand the role of Zach Kayes and, and uh, his, his version of the story in, and how that applies today. But one of the things he likes to say about this is, if you steal my car on Monday and you tell me you're sorry on Tuesday and you're still driving my car on Wednesday, you're not actually sorry. In fact, if you have, if you get saved on Tuesday and tell me you're sorry, you should be bringing my car back with a full tank of gas and a fresh wash, <laughs> right? And so that, you know, we have had too many people that stole the car on Monday, got saved on Tuesday, and then are still driving the car on Wednesday. That's our churches today. And yeah, so this history aspect, I think that a church particularly started before the Civil War, but even 1900, because uh, a pastor late in his life in 1900 could have been an enslaver before the Civil War. So that's why I think you, get, you need to go a little bit past the Civil War. Needs to, first step you need to do is know your history. So we, I did this for my, my own church. I've helped a couple other churches and organizations do this. In 2019, for the 400th anniversary of black enslavement in America, we, we held a service where we named a thing we had never named in our history before. And I went through the census records and found that four of our first seven pastors had been enslavers including the founder who was enslaving three people when he started the church. Uh, eight of the 11 white charter members were enslavers. The guy who gave the land where the building sits today was an enslaver and had quite a few. And so but this has never been in the church history before. So from the pulpit, I laid out this history. That this is our history. That's the first step. So that's Was the, that the, the, the most the... liked sermon on YouTube ever? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, yeah, I know, right? Um, I'm, I'm nothing but popular here. So the uh, but I mean, so when I said that four out of seven of, the, of our first pastors were enslavers, there were audible gasps in the congregation because these are not the stories in white families that we pass on to the next generation. You remember when great grandpa? was enslaving 12 people. Yeah, those were the good old days. All right, let's make America great again like that. Um, the, 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 we don't pass those stories on and we need to. So that's, that is the first step. We have to first tell those stories. Then we have to find a way to do like genuine lament and repentance. And I think it's important that we spend some time there. If our church was so wrong on that, let's not get too cocky and think that we couldn't be wrong today. Like it's literally in the DNA, but then I do think we have to get to that next step. If we're truly sorry, Zacchaeus doesn't just say, sorry guys, you know what? I met Jesus and I'm really sorry. And I'm not going to do that anymore. Right? He makes it right. He pays reparations and he pays a number that you find in multiple texts. It's all through the old Testament you know, paying four or five times back. It's even embedded in the story that Nathan the prophet tells to, to David. I mean, it's, it's, it's something that's in our text and we don't like to read it because uh, in this means that repentance is costly. Uh, but we're not going to move forward. And I mean this both for bla the, the black community, black churches, black institutions, but also for white people, white churches, white institutions, we're not going to be able to move forward until we deal with this original sin of so many of our churches and institutions. Mm. It, it's, it's almost like, um, <laughs> like Christian race theory, almost, um, that, that you're, that I'm coining that phrase, by the way. Um, so good job. <laughs> all right, all right. Come under the ire of, uh, of whatever <laughs> Anderson, what is his name? Or Lindsay, James, James Lindsay. Lindsay. <laughs> He's gonna tweet that you repent. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. I, 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 you know, what do you think about that? You know, James Lindsay, Brian. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What do you think about this like odd bedfellow thing with the Southern Baptist Convention? All right. So yeah. So critical race theory is banned on on the seminary cam campuses of Southern Baptists because six white guys got together in a Zoom room and said, hey, let's ban people from talking about race on our college campus, on our institution campuses, a couple of which were founded by enslavers and have buildings named for enslavers today. I mean, if that's not a case for critical race theory, I don't know what is. It's like a parody, right? Let's get six white guys 
you know, who are all running institutions founded by enslavers. And let's ban any conversation of anything that might be critical of our racist past. Right. I mean, so first of all, that's really ironic. But they, they ban critical race theory on what grounds? That it's secular. And then who do they bring in as their evidence? An atheist. I mean, like, I, I give up. I mean, like, there's just, there's just no, there's no theological uh, logic or, you know, legitimacy to, it, it's just, it's just race. Like, let's just, let's just be honest. Yeah. You don't want to talk about the racist past because you don't want to deal with racism. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. The, uh, um, like, we, we've had James Lindsay um, on our show. We did a whole series on critical race theory brought in you know proponents and then people that opposed it and and he um you know he 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 made a case um from kind of where he stood um and it was probably one of our more popular ones and we we definitely got a lot of hate mail for it and i and i and i always tell always tell people like you know okay well like his arguments are what they are he was actually a really nice guy like <laughs> Like as a person, like he was just a, he was just a real genuine, just sort of like down earth dude. You know, he just, he just believes something that I don't believe, but like we could have a conversation about it. That's the whole point of like our podcast. Like I'm the flamey liberal and, and Josh is the racist conservative, you know, like that's, that's the <laughs> dynamic. Yeah. So, you know, and, and but when, when you're talking um, kind of about, you know, you know, how Christians maybe should look at, at reparations because you know, some of it is sort of based in on biblical stories, um, tradition. Um, it, I, I got to thinking about like, you know, at what point does, does like our, our motivation for doing things grounded on our Christian beliefs, you know, turn into, um, you know, Christianizing our legislation, you know, and, and, and how, how do we, how do we kind of separate the two? You know, I mean, like you could say, you know, I, we should all have prayer in school and that, and that comes out of this sort of like belief as a Christian that, you know, prayer works and so on and so forth. But also like you could say, Hey, we should, we should have open borders because like, you know, um, Jesus was an immigrant, you know? And, and, and like, so, so like, where's the, where's the line that, that you draw? Yeah, that's, I mean, one of the things that I, I try to, to discourage is we don't need a religious left. It's just a mirror image of the religious right. right? And, and, I, and I feel like that that happens a lot in some of the activism on the religious left is, and again, it's that idea of like, well, they're bad because they're trying to use the faith to, you know, codify their beliefs, but we really want to be in charge, right? It's not that we're actually against codifying our religious beliefs. It's just that we don't like those religious beliefs. We want these religious beliefs. And so that's a definite, uh, you know, temptation, I think, to to watch against. And I think that when it comes to public policy, that I think you have to make an argument, even if you are led to a position by your sincere religious beliefs, the argument for why the society as a whole would adopt it needs to be a non-religious, non-sectarian argument. It needs to be something that I can advocate for this policy, let's say borders, whatever direction you're going, and uh, a Muslim and an atheist and, you know, so on and so on could also advocate for this position because it's not based on thus saith the Lord thy God. Right. And so, you know, that's the issue. It, even though your motivations are leading you down a certain direction, the argument you make for public policy, how you frame that, I think, is really critical. Mm, wow. That's that's so on point. Uh, well, we're, we're, we're just about out of time, Brian. So, I mean, for starters, I just want to say thank you for spending some time with us. This is a pretty awesome conversation. Like we, Josh and I love talking about this kind of stuff. That's why we created a podcast over it, you know, but, <laughs> um, and, uh, but, but wh wh where else can, can people catch you? Um, I know you, you run the word and way, way and word. Is it word and way? Word and word way. And way. So, so tell us a little bit about that and kind of the, the projects that you're working on. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Yeah, Word and Way, we've been around since 1896. We just celebrated 125 years as a publication based in Missouri. And we have a monthly magazine and a website, Word and Way, spell out the and, uh, wordandway.org. Uh, we also, we have a podcast, a Dangerous Dogma, and we have a Substack newsletter. And this is where we particularly get into some of the meaty conversations of religion and politics. 
And so if, if you've enjoyed uh, this conversation, you're still listening, uh, publicwitness.wordandway.org is where you can sign up for that. We've got essays uh, every week coming out, a couple of them. And uh, I mean, you know, if you didn't enjoy this conversation, you probably already gave up already. But if, <laughs> if you're still listening, like really go to publicwitness.wordandway.org, long form, deep dives into relig religion and politics. Uh, it, it's where I think my best work goes right now. So that's where, where I would encourage people to go read. All right. Well, great. Well, th thank you again so much. And um, good to be back for season three. This is a great way to kick it off. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you, listeners. And we will uh, see you next week. All right. Yes, thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.